Hey YouTube, well here we are back in the shop and today I was working on a, an order of floating shelves and I thought I'd touch on a couple of things uh, today that uh, might be, uh, hopefully be new information for you or maybe uh, help you with a couple things. Uh, but anyway, being I'm doing floating shelves, uh, I'm working towards using the, the locking uh, miter router bit, uh, but I haven't got things all set up and ready to go yet. So this order I, I'm doing what I'm familiar with which is uh, cutting everything on 45s, well, 40, 45.5s roughly. And uh, I missed on this one, my, my uh, angle's not great, so I've got, I've got lots of play in the joints, but uh, without lots of glue and some blocking, and uh, it seems to work. There's one thing that you guys should be aware of. On the, uh, the Craig track saw, um, this is what I'm using now, and I'm not sure so much on the on the, the solid wood, the dimensional lumber, but on plywood, these edges are so sharp that if you're not careful, you will literally slice your cord. I'm gonna to try and find uh, pictures for you. Um, I may have deleted them, I'm not sure, but I'll try and, and put pictures in the video. Uh, but I've literally sliced my cord a couple of times on these really, really sharp 45s. Um, so be careful when you're setting up to cut 45s that your cord's not dragging across those angles. So in this, this is probably boring for you guys, but I thought there may be some guys out there that haven't done anything with like floating shelves before. So um, I thought I'd go ahead and show you what I'm doing, right or wrong, I don't know. Um, most of my shelves, unless the customer specifies, most of my shelves are going to be three inch shelves. And the reason for that is because I end up with an inch and a half inside. And the reason I have an inch and a half inside is that I can easily mount it on a two by two or a two by four. Uh, just stick that on the side of the wall on your studs, slip your, your uh, floating shelf over top of it and a couple of finished screws and you're done, you're good to go. Uh, so they're very easy to mount. Um, skinny, uh, thinner is no problem. You just have to adapt your, your mounting method. And this one I'm doing here, this one I'm doing here is open both ends. So I don't have to worry about, I don't have to worry about it being perfectly even on the ends or anything like that. Um, and on the open both ends, I always leave them an inch or two long um, so that the customer can uh, scribe them on site. So you can uh, adjust the angle of your, your ends and make them fit perfectly. And I'm using the fiberglass enforced packing tape. Uh, I've can't, I can't suggest a brand yet because uh, um, I'm not real happy this this has a bad habit of not bonding well and bonding too well at the same time um, some of it will literally just fall off while other strands when you pull the, pa the tape off excuse me it leaves strands on the surface and you can't get them off for nothing doesn't matter what you do uh, I've tried, tried different solvents and uh, rub and rub and rub and uh, um, you can get it to soften uh, but sometimes it's a real challenge to get all that little glue residue, get all the glue residue and, and uh, fiberglass strands off. But uh, on dimensional lumber it's not, on dimensional lumber it's not that big a deal, you can sand and uh, you'll get there eventually. But on plywood, you have to be careful because you'll sand through the veneer before you get the, the tape residue off. Okay. And uh, because uh, I'm using I'm using a track saw, so I'm using a track to cut my 45s. But on the centerpiece, when I aim for three. But, you know, you're doing a, a um, you're scribing a line. You're doing a measure and scribe a line. And so there's, 
there's a good chance of error on the center one. So the center one always kind of fluctuates a little bit, three, three and a sixteenth, two and fifteen in there somewhere. It doesn't really matter. But um, when I assemble them, these end up being really strong. They really, uh, this one's going to be a, a little over six feet. And I'm not too worried about blocks up at the front. I'll probably do them this time because my miter's a little bit open. So I want to kind of reinforce that miter on the front edge. Um, but uh, generally, they don't need to be blocked. I block for shipping so I can get them to the job site. But uh, when you install them, you've got blocking in the ends and blocking down the back. And the, uh, the front, it's got plenty of glue surface, so it's fine. As long as your joints are, are decent, which, like I said, they're not this time. But when I assemble them in the back side uh, of the fold, uh, there's room to play. Uh, even once the, the uh, joint's set up, um, it's still, there's still going to be some flex in there. Um, so I can just use a full 2x2 two two and uh, use them for blocking in the back just to secure it. Uh, but then when uh, I leave a uh, 2x2 two two long enough, wherever I put it, I leave a 2x2 two two long enough so that once they get folded, then I can test fit and I can cut blocks to fit that will go down in and sit on this folded edge, the, the front edge, um, if I need it, if my miters are loose. And uh, I could just drop it down there and, and glue a couple blocks along to reinforce that, that miter joint. Okay, so. Okay, and this is a little longer, because or a little tougher, because my arms aren't that long. So I'm going to slide this one. Usually, quite often you can just pick it up by the center, uh, center piece, but obviously I can't do that today. So we'll just do this and roll it over. There you go. And uh, basically we're just going to glue those joints. Uh-oh, I get that one too tight. That one overlapped a little bit. I'm going to have to re-tape re it, I think. I'll probably split the tape. I don't think I'm going to worry about it though. Let's see. Let's see if I still have a hinge. Yeah, I still have a hinge. So I'll come back after, after I fold it and uh, work on that from the other side. Um, so make sure everything's nice and clean. Try and get any chunkies and dust over there. And then uh, I use the high glue. And you can slop it in there as much as you want. Whatever gets on the front, you can uh, clean it up easy peasy. I did a little video of uh, why I use hide glue, uh, but unfortunately it didn't turn out very good. So I edited that out of uh, this video. And uh, if I remember, I'll, I'll do it again and uh, tag it on the end. There's different forms of hide glue too. You can mix the hide glue up yourself in a pot, uh, but that's a whole lot like work. and. Uh, um, have you might have trouble with consistency and things like that, but this this uh, factory made hide has basically the same same properties, and it's just so easy. And I like to, especially when this miter joint is open. Yeah. Now, I didn't get a, a very good 45 on this. Uh, then I want to make sure I get glue right down to the point because that's going to be my main main contact. I'm not very entertaining. I'm really curious about that, uh, um, what do they call it, locking miter. Um, I'm hoping that will help because obviously you end up with gaps and things in this, but uh, it is a bit of a pain to set up. I've been uh, a couple of trials and I ended up running out of, out of scraps of wood. So I'll have some leftover out of these shelves that I'll be able to screw with. Um, okay, now this is the trick. Uh, where am I? Uh, I'm gonna worry about 90s later. Make sure I get that the right direction. And pull it nice and tight so you got some pressure on that. And you may want to make sure you block the back because if you're not careful the back is going to pinch and you won't have room for your mounting block uh, for your 2x2 two two or 2x4 two on the wall and uh, 
The only way you're going to get it is to pop that joint open, pop one of your 45s open, and uh, there you are starting over. Oh man, it's wide open. Okay, and um, 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 that didn't work. How's this? Normally, I guess I didn't have my joints flat when I taped them, so I think they were overlaying each other a little bit. So now we got to pull the joints together on this side. Yeah, but normally if I get it taped well, if the joints are nice and flush on the other side when I tape them, then this isn't an issue. But even at that, it's not hard to do. Just pull your joints together. I think I'm going to throw a couple of joints in there. Uh, just to help, uh, help hold it at the 90. And these don't matter because he's going to cut off both ends and uh, sometimes you just need nails anyway. Sometimes it just can't be helped. Uh, but he's got uh, four extra inches. And these are just the little, what is it, 23 gauge pin nails. It's amazing what those little suckers will hold. The one nice thing with the, uh, the tight bond glue, you got all this mess to clean up. All this glue sticking out that you need to get cleaned up before it dries. Um, and you also kind of want to burnish your corners because uh, once the glue dries, then that makes your wood solid and it doesn't burnish very well. It doesn't, you know, kind of roll that edge very well. Uh, but with the high glue, I can go over it with a damp towel. I can clean up, clean up all this stuff and uh, it also softens the glue in the corner so when I burnish it, uh, the corner soft again um, and uh, so the glue will set up and it'll, it'll hold that little roll <clears throat> and this is also good for filling little nail holes um, again because it, it'll take stain then it doesn't matter too much um, if it shows through when you do it with the tight bond, you kind of have to be careful because your your glue is going to show in your stain. So you really have to be careful making your making your filler with the tight bond that you're not just getting little little glue spots all over your piece. Okay, I'll give you a close up. See you know, all that glue doesn't matter. It'll it'll clean up later. No problem. Okay, and this is the the smaller ones I've done. And uh, let's see. Come around here to look at the finished ends. They're not bad. That's just a little bit of glue, but again, the stain's going to take to that, so it doesn't matter. Okay. Okay, YouTube, I wanted to show you why I use hide glue on uh, my finished pieces near the finished surface. Um, if, if it's not going to be shown, if, it's, if, if the glue won't be visible in any place on the, on the piece, then by all means I use tight bond. Uh, I use a lot more tight bond than I do hide glue. But uh, anywhere where the, the glue is going to be near a finished surface and there's a chance of it showing through the stain, uh, then I always use hide glue. And uh, there's a couple of reasons for that. Um, well, first of all, you need to be careful with hide glue because it's water soluble even after it's dry. So if your piece is going to be exposed to moisture, then you do not want to use hide glue. But even though hide glue um, is water soluble when it's dry, hide glue is water soluble when it's dry. So even though it's a disadvantage, on the other hand, there's, there's advantages to that too. And the one being that you can clean up any glue on a finished surface. Uh, so for example, on my shelves here, I don't care how much oozes out the corners. I'll just let it set up and I'll come back to it later. If I was using tight bond, then I got a problem because I'm using tape for a hinge and all that glue that oozes out underneath the tape is gonna be a problem. Uh, but with the hide glue, I can always come back and clean it up, don't have to worry about it. Uh, so again, so I wanna show you why hide glue 
Okay, so I've got a little bit of spill on my surface that I didn't see. And let's see. Oops. I've got a little bit of tight bond spilled on my surface. Well, I hate using alder to show you guys, but you know, I guess you're worth it. Um, okay. A little bit of tight bond spilled on the surface. And just so I remember which is which. Okay, hide and tight bond. Okay, I'm going to go over and use my hair dryer and get these set up. Oh no, I've got glue spilled on my, my finished surface. What am I going to do? Okay, so the hide glue. Coming with a damp rag. A little bit of oh, fresh sandpaper. Okay. So now we'll dry it and get the moisture out of the wood. Okay. Okay, my friends, and that is why I used high glue near a stained, uh, stained surface. Um, you can always come back and hide it. So you can see how open my 45s are. So if you look way on down there, you can see I've added in some blocking just to help secure that uh, front angle. And uh, once it's installed, it's going to have blocks on the side and it'll have block full length on the back. And uh, there'll be a, a block down here too. So uh, it'll be plenty strong. Um, just a little bit of reinforcement up front. And uh, my glue still wasn't quite set up. So I went ahead and uh, um, taped up again just to pull those corners tight. And I'll just end up leaving it till tomorrow and come back and work on it tomorrow. Uh, so we'll, we'll come back and have a look at it then. See you later. Okay, so here we are back in the shop after a couple days. Uh, this had plenty of time to dry. Uh, things are set up pretty good. So we're gonna go ahead and Pull our tape off. So that's one thing to keep in mind with hide glue. Uh, the dry time is very subject to your weather. So if you have a, a hot, humid day, it's gonna take the hide glue quite a bit longer to set up. Um, but again, it's well worth it when it comes to not having to worry. Because here we are. We talked about all that glue on the surface and we don't have to worry about it. Okay, so I'm gonna finish unwrapping this and uh, we'll come back in a minute and clean up some of that hide glue. Okay, we'll give you a good look at those corners. See how this stuff sticks? A lot of it doesn't stick at all, and then you've got strings of uh, fiberglass that just will not come off. But anyway, we'll work on that. See, so we got some gaps in here. No biggie. Don't sweat the little stuff. And we got all that hide glue on the surface. Hopefully you can see that okay. It's hard to tell what's going to show up from the camera. Okay, on a damp rag, and just work your corners. So this is uh, when to do this Saturday, and this is now Monday. So it's it's well cured. Oh, and I got a nice run down the side here too. No problem with getting lots of moisture in there, to a point. Because again, high glue being water soluble, if you get too much in, you can loosen up that joint. And even wiping out the high glue, I still like to work with the grain. Because um, there's still a good chance that some will show, even though your stain's going to, going to blend a lot better than it would with the tight bond. Um, you're still, you're working the glue into the grain. 
it'll be much better, but there's still a chance it'll be there. So if you blend it with the grain, then it's gonna be a lot less of a problem. And also adding moisture, you're gonna raise the grain anyway, so obviously you need to sand it out. There it is. And then this is also working moisture into the, the surface of the corner. So when we roll that corner, then that glue is going to be a little softer. Um, it's not going to be preventing that corner from rolling and then it'll set up and it'll help uh, bond your roll. <laughs> it'll help bond the pieces together that you've just finished rolling. And you see this wood over here has a little bit of a hint of orange where the glue was, but it'll be fine. We're going to come back and sand this in a second. Okay. Just work that surface where the glue was. It takes a few minutes, but it's not that big a deal. Some Ferber Glass tape. Okay, and then we've talked about burnishing the corners. Uh, and basically all that's doing is rolling these corners together so that any of these little seams that you see, it just kind of blends the two points together. And for the most part, this is pretty good. There's a couple little spots. Um, but I like to use a curved pin, a curved locking pin from a draw bar. And I've got that little radius in there. And uh, a straight pin's fine. You can roll a straight pin, but I just like having that radius in there to start with. And I still roll the radius as I'm working. And it doesn't usually take a lot. Um, the uh, um, dimensional lumber takes a little more than the than plywood, but it's a lot more forgiving too. You've got a lot of material you can work with here. Where with the plywood, you really just don't. You don't have much material at all. These corners roll a lot easier on plywood. I'll give you that. This solid wood's a little bit more of a job. So if you remember the only mechanical fasteners we have on this one are right down here in the ends that are going to get cut off so these are nice clean edges no no nail holes no pins nothing once we get them burnished and sanded it'll just look like it's one solid piece of wood okay So I've got uh, shipping blocks down here in these corners, and these will come off, but I'm just gonna throw a pin just to hold them in place. A little sanding. So there you have it, YouTube. Uh, there's different different products and different uh, ways of going about doing uh, a lot of different jobs. And I just wanted to uh, to make sure you guys were aware of the, the high glue, how well it works, uh, that it has a applications, especially on stained surfaces, and uh, uh, just some of the things you need to be careful about. Um, main thing being moisture. Uh, and again, it's a pro and a con. Um, anyway, YouTube, I hope this is helpful. Uh, I hope I've showing you a couple things that are new that you hadn't thought about. I hope it gives you food for thought and uh, I hope you'll uh, like and subscribe and uh, keep watching for uh, more things down the road. Thanks guys. Have a great day.